Hi, my name is Jared Wiley and I'm a recent graduate of Product Design, Marketing and Innovation at Maynooth University. I am currently studying a Master's in Design Innovation. As part of the Master's, we had to complete a research study on a topic of our choice. As a recent graduate of Product Design and coming to the realisation of the application of the skills that I acquired throughout my education in relation to entrepreneurship, it quickly became an interesting subject topic. When conducting a literature review, I soon realised that a lot of the world's leading companies were founded by entrepreneurs with a design background. And this added to my choice of topic for the research study. Throughout the literature, it was clear that the role of a designer is constantly changing. It was also evident that product designers had an advantage when it came to new venture creation. 99% of uh, European companies are small to medium enterprises. So the need for education to create entrepreneurs has never been more important. I decided to explore this further as part of my research study. I used a mixed method approach of data collection using both qualitative and quantitative data to aid my research. I conducted a number of interviews with entrepreneurs with a design background and recent graduates of product or industrial design. I conducted a survey aimed at recent graduates of product design in Ireland with a total of 44 responses. I then analysed the data by coding the interviews and grouping the findings into reoccurring themes. My name is Martin Ryan and I am the co-founder and inventor of the Boo Saddle. I am a lecturer in Minute and programme director of the product design degree. So I was actively horse riding at the time, it was my final year in college. I had one or two horses. It started because we had to choose our own brief and from doing a lot of horse riding I thought there's a piece of equipment that hasn't changed much. I didn't have a particular issue with it but I just thought it hadn't changed much and what isn't it worth um, giving it a good investigation. Because I was in final year in college it started by research so I talked to some leading riders in Ireland and um, I specifically I focusing on the, the requirements of the saddle. Then I talked to, I went to the UCD veterinary library and I sort of studied the anatomy of the horse to try and understand the biomechanics of the horse. And I synthesized all of that into kind of key criteria that the saddle needed to meet. Moved on to ideation then and little sketch models started to explore interesting mechanisms to try and replicate the mo movement of, of a horse and that led to the cantilevered principle. And um, then started to build it at full size. So I started to take a, I used wire mesh and plaster paris to take a cast of a horse's back and um, to, to get the form of the horse. And then I, 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 I digitized that and started to build in CAD on top of that um, and prototype out from that over iterative cycles. Um, and later, uh, that was kind of the college project. Later, uh, progressively, I got help with um, some companies, some really good companies in composites, so we could build fully working prototypes. Um, investors got involved some years later, and uh, we continued to test and refine and with the assistance of the Army Equitation School and uh, in terms of their ex expert riders and, and other experts around the place until the point we were ready to launch. Um, I'm Alan, I am the director of R&D, but uh, I'm co-founder of Stakehold. Uh, I'm Ben, I'm creative director, also co-founder. I, I have a degree from Sligo and NCAD, uh, both BA, BA in Industrial Design from Sligo and a Bachelor of Design from NCAD. Yeah, and I have the Bachelor of Design from NCAD. Four years ago, a guy called Michael Cosman walked into our offices and uh, he had an idea for a product. And uh, after sign signing a few NDAs and getting through all that kind of stuff, he had this idea actually for a, a uh, cargo organizer that used uh, hook tape that would stick to your carpet and would create a, a wall inside your boot. And we were kind of skeptical at the time, we're like, well, would that really work? Would it hold? Um, so we did some initial research, kind of seeing what was out there, 
And then we kind of got back to him and said, yeah, you have a, a viable idea. And uh, how do you want to take it further? And uh, it was a time of like, it was recession. It was, so uh, we came up with this partnership that we'd all, you know, form a company together. We'd all invest equally and we'd be, we would uh, develop this product with them and take it to market. Uh, Tom Maxwell, uh, Director of Design, Tomax Products Limited. Well, Turboscope was, um, as I say, uh, it was an idea that I had when I was pretty young, uh, being mad into cars and stuff when I was like, you know, as soon as I could ride a bike, I was riding a bike and being into cars, I would cycle around everywhere, making motorcycle noises and stuff like that with my mouth and, you know, um, and it was just, I don't know, the freedom that you get when you're a kid and you can ride a bike and there are no stabilizers and you're sort of waving goodbye to your parents and you're tearing off like, uh, you know, around the garden and stuff, it was, it was good fun and so, um, and my dad stopped me one day and he, and he said, you know, you're making all the noise with your mouth. Like when I was a kid, we used to put a playing card in our spokes. So he, he got a playing card and put it on with a clothes peg. And I was like, this is amazing. This is, you know, great fun, really interactive and stuff. Um, and it lasted for about sort of five minutes before the card like rolled around the bar or got wet or got torn apart. So that was really where the idea came from. I kind of thought there's got to be, you know, there's got to be a product that you can buy that does this. And, um, uh, you know, I'd go into like my local bike shop to see if they do anything that made a noise for your bike and they didn't and the toy shops didn't have anything like that. And so I went home and I, I, all I wanted to do at the time was just to put something on my bike that was going to make more noise. So I made up like a little wooden kind of a prototype and then clamped it onto the bar and my dad helped me and he drilled the holes in the middle of it and we sort of stuck in like an old credit card into it that was crazy loud, like it was way too stiff. Turbo spoke fits to any kind of bike and makes it look and sound like a real motorbike. I think for me that when I realized it was actually you know, something that was viable was when we did our sort of our test marketing for the product, when we had s prototypes put together from those CAD files and we went to some of the international trade shows um, the we always sort of thought globally with it because um, I suppose we were always aware that the Irish market was quite small for what we were looking at and you know uh, the global toy industry is, is pretty big, uh, America's a big deal, um, so that was really where we started was going to those trade shows, getting contacts and, then, and actually showing it to people who have no family ties, no allegiance to you whatsoever, you're just one of a number of other people with a stall and they come along and you've got a bike and you're spinning the wheel and it's going wham, 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 you know, and they're going, oh, that's cool, you know, kids would love this, you know, and uh, that was a real buzz because like I was, at that time I was about 18 and um, that was great. I think to get that, you know, uh, kind of affirmation from, you know, just strangers really, um, and uh, that was great. I think that was the when I realised, yeah, no, there's definitely some potential here. I suppose I have to, uh, you know, give credit to my dad for that. My dad's always been very influential in what we do. Uh, we still work with him, you know. Um, he, he was the one who he's always been quite entrepreneurial himself. Um, and he saw it and he thought this, this you know, there's definitely got to be a market for, for this. So he actually asked around and spoke to some people that he knew sort of um, on the periphery of the toy industry. Was it, it, It's one of those things that's a gradual process. You know, you start out where you, you know, you have to create some prototypes and some samples, which is expensive. You know, you need to bankroll that. Um, and then uh, it's a case of trying to use uh, any of any contacts that you have, you know, through doing trade shows and things like that and really, you know, reaching out to contacts who can, I suppose, who can make it happen. Uh, my name is David Craig, I'm the founder of Dublin Design Studio. Uh, I'm an architect and after 15 years in the business, um, things weren't quite going so well for the construction industry as they had been before. Um, at that point, I really didn't see a, a, a positive future and look to other things, things that could interest me and keep me entertained while construction uh, came back around again. One of the ideas I came up with from, I suppose, my interest in electronics and design and products and things like that was uh, Scriba. Uh, one of a number of ideas I came up with and I decided that I'd give it a shot. I'd uh, try and turn the concept into reality. The original idea was a simple sketch. Uh, really. I'm somebody who uses uh, stylus as part of my design workflow and I really felt that none of them, none of them actually designed around the hat. Uh, I wanted something a little bit more comfortable rather than one of those very, very fine little styluses or the big chubby ones that tried to emulate big fat pens. I tried to create something different. 
My yeah. name is Dean Douglas Evans and I'm co-founder of Golf Birdie. Golf Birdie is an app that allows golfers to view tee to green flyovers of golf courses around the world. It's basically like booking.com for, for golf courses. Yeah, basically we were filming, we had a company called Prodrome prior to Golf Birdie. We were filming a lot of hotels and we got asked to film a golf course. And when we filmed that golf course we were going to put the video onto their website and we kind of realised that it wouldn't reach a large audience so we came up with the idea to build a platform to put all the golf courses on one, in one place, build the audience that way and attract all the golfers to us rather than trying to get it out to them. My name is James Maxwell and I'm a design researcher based in the Innovation Value Institute at Maynooth University. All I did the undergrad here in Maynooth in product design, marketing and innovation and now I'm a design innovation master's student here in Maynooth also. Hey, my name is Michael Torrens and I'm a product designer at Cleolight. Uh, I first studied engineering in DIT, I then moved on to product design in DIT as well and then did a master's in Maynooth design innovation. Um, in product design I would have learned a lot of technical skills, a lot of hard skills, and um, being an engineering college, a lot of it was geared towards the engineering side of product design, and um, not as much on maybe the soft skills, certainly not enough on the likes of sketching and the design thinking models. Evan Hannan, I'm a Dublin-based product designer, and I work on product development and 3D printing. Um, I studied uh, product design, marketing, and innovation for four years in Maynooth University. It was clear from the literature review and throughout the nine interviews that the role of a designer is constantly evolving to meet the demand in society. Walt 1992 defines product design as the activity in which ideas and needs are given physical form, initially as solution concepts and then as a specific configuration or arrangements of elements, materials and components. The core of what I think being an industrial designer is about is about creating something new that the people need or that fulfills a purpose. And that's kind of what I box off as the industrial design part. And then all that other stuff is the things that are necessary to, to kind of get that out there. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they're the things that you don't realize until you, you try and go it alone. Yeah. And you think it's just about design, but it isn't. You know? They kind of had an innate talent for drawing, for create spatial awareness and creating stuff and they had sort of good ideas that they projected onto markets and, and often styled them nicely. I think this designer now um, is being trained more intensively on, on the research side of things and trying to understand people and dig deep into the op you know, their needs and the opportunities. Um, like my role begins with, you know, all the way from conception the whole way through development pricing, marketing, um, you know, developed right the way through to um, like factory visits and you know quality control and stuff. I mean that's you know it's nuts and bolts. That's kind of like my role covers almost everything apart from the hardcore kind of commercial side of what we do. Um, An industrial designer, product designer is someone who used to just make the product look nice but now is responsible for the whole product from start to finish as far as I'm concerned. They're responsible for finding out if the product is needed and um, usually if you're in a consultancy you're just told that the product's needed and you have to do what you're told and build whatever the client wants but I suppose it's your obligation to make sure you get it as right as you can and you make sure that there you keep them on the right path or turn them onto the right path. Um, but a product designer is generally someone with the skills to take an idea from concept all the way through to the very last point when it's coming off. Not even when it's coming off the machine, when it's landing in Ireland or wherever it is and getting it on shelves, the kind of the product designer needs to be at every single touch point along that process because it's there. It's generally there the most involved in the product from start to finish. The role of a designer changes throughout different companies depending on their size. But I suppose the role of a designer in a small company is like, you know, probably well at least 50%. 
you know, if not slightly more than that. Um, it's a pretty broad role um, in a small company, but say in a larger company, it's less so. You know, it's, it's much more focused to concept development. Product and industrial designers in the past mainly focused on the technical aspect of the design process, from ideation to manufacturing specifications. But it's clear the role has evolved since then. Now the designer must use research techniques to analyse the relevant population of users to identify the user's needs. Once these needs are identified, they can begin to conceptualise ideas to meet and exceed these needs. There were many connections and similarities that product designers and entrepreneurs have in common, and it was discussed and mentioned by all participants. But yeah, I think all the traits of a good designer would be a good entrepreneur. Um, there's yeah. very little that would dif dif differentiate them. Um, like the best designers would make the best entrepreneurs. Yeah, I believe that we'd have kind of a wide spectrum of skills that would be conducive to entrepreneurship. And I think it goes both ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think the I think the two things should be separate. I think I think there's an opportunity in, in many many people's industries that people who are designers can fit in and, and work well within a team. And I think there's no reason why the, the two things should be exclusive. There was a number of traits and similarities that both designers and entrepreneurs share, but some participants agree that designers don't realise this. Yeah, I definitely think there's a lot of similarities between entrepreneurs and designers. Um, I think it's, it's something a, a lot of designers may not realise. Product designers coming out of college, I don't know if they are always equipped with the right skills to be entrepreneurs. Design is the toolbox to understand your user and, and then to solve once you, once you understand how to provide a solution to them. So it's kind of, that's just the center of entrepreneurship, of business, you're, you're selling a service to a user. I think being a designer, it definitely gives you a, a sort of a different take on things. It allows you to kind of view, uh, you know, a lot of it is problem solving. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, problem solving is something that entrepreneurs come up against all the time. You know, you, you have to, especially as a, as a small business where you're starting out, uh, where you don't have, you know, seriously deep pockets to throw money at problems and, you know, and, and get, like, marketing coverage and things like that. You have to think about things in a more creative way. You know, you may be hit with a, hit with a brick wall and have to adapt around a problem. Um, and so I think that as a, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur starting out, um, I think that uh, some of those sort of um, some of those skills that you you learn and you develop as a designer definitely aid you in the ability to kind of um, <clears throat> just to kind of look at look at problems, solve them in different ways, and come up with kind of new and different ways of kind of tackling um, issues. Decision making is another massive one. Whether uh, whether you need to choose uh, the right material for a project as a as a designer or the, um, in, a, in a business, you need to make a hundred decisions a day. Um, um, they don't all need to be right, but they, they need to be the, the right choice at the right time. Decision making and risk taking go hand in hand and by making effective decisions, it can mitigate risk. Um, I think that entrepreneurs are risk takers and designers take risks in the name of discovery and learning. And we treat failure from taking a risk as a learning, a learning curve rather than something to be looked upon negatively. And I think. We try to put design first in in pretty much every case. You know, um, like even if it is expansion or it's whatever, we yeah. we try and. We try and design everything so that it's efficient. So, like Anne said, it, it, it mitigates the risk then. Apart from the skills that both entrepreneurs and product designers share, a lot of the participants believe that there's a lot that entrepreneurs can learn from designers. That you will have an advantage over people that don't have this kind of skill set. Um, if I know if I was just studying business and came out and tried to open a business, you would, you would probably fall down a lot easier than someone that had a design background where they would. The skill of visual storytelling is mentioned as an advantage both 
in the literature and in the interviews. I guess it's something that uh, that designers are are great at and spend a lot of time working on. Um, people, people in business, whether it's a brand, a logo, uh, a client presentation, uh, visual visual skills make them stand out. So um, I guess at the same time, there's there's a lot uh, entrepreneurs and business people can learn from designers um, that will help them stand out. Designers have the advantage of being visual storytellers. What this means is they can often create the perception that something is real or tangible early on to rally potential co-founders and investors around their vision. The core one being empathy. I think that that's probably the most important tool in the, the arsenal of a designer. Many startups don't talk to customers until the product is in beta, instead assuming they know what users want. Designers serve as a conduit for ensuring the voice of the customer is represented in each stage of the development. This relates directly to the use of design thinking methodologies, where empathy and understanding customer needs is the first step in the, of the design thinking method. Design thinking methodologies are at the heart of how a designer thinks, and it can be applied and used for every aspect of the design process. Design thinking focuses on having the customer at every stage of the product development. By identifying what the user truly needs and wants, a designer can then use creative thinking techniques to formulate a number of concepts to meet these needs or even exceed these needs. Design thinking at its essence is the generalized rules of a designer's mind put into a process for possibly for those who might not necessarily be that way inclined. Design thinking is not just about designing products. The methodology itself can be used and applied to any aspect of a business. Many founders of the world's biggest companies have a design background and it's all down to the correct use of design thinking. So the biggest reason for a company's failing, I know in some surveys they'll say it's because um, there's not a good, they haven't identified a worthwhile problem. It's really the, the biggest reason for failing is not understanding what the customer wants. I think if you make a beautiful product, if you make a, a beautiful app or try to you know, put all your time into something, it has to be something that people want to love than just yourself. The design thinking method begins by identifying the needs of the customer by gaining empathy for the user and establishing a deep understanding of what they need and want. When you truly understand their needs, then you can begin to solve. The key thing for a business is to identify a market need and the market need comes down to people and understanding what they want and what they need to make their life easier and design um, really emphasizes a focus on the user, on the customer and understanding that need. When you get that right, then, you've a bit, then you have potential to start a business around that solution. Um, if you can't understand your end user, you can't understand their needs. And if you can't understand their needs, it's like playing darts blindfolded in regards to the chances of your business succeeding. After identifying the need, creative conceptualization is used to formulate a number of concepts. The concepts are then put through a selection process to refine and select the most viable and feasible, all while focusing on the customer needs. The techniques that were taught in ideation in design thinking are conducive to creativity so that we can come up with multiple concepts instead of possibly just uh, running with the one you've always possibly had in your mind so um, you can always find, you can pick out the best and screen the best ideas. Um, one of the most important ones for me would be user testing, to be constantly testing your ideas with users um, throughout the project to make sure that what you're making is something that people want to buy and is going to help affect them in the way that you aim for it to change their lives. Design thinking can be applied and used in any aspect of any business. No matter what business you have or what you're selling to the customer, design thinking can be applied to make what you're doing more efficient. I remember we went up to a coffee shop <coughs> and we, we did the order process of how someone orders a cup of coffee for them. And the mind was kind of blown to see like, 
okay, you are in the shop, and how is it, how does someone order? And then that, okay. infor that informed the whole layout design for the, yeah. for the cafe as well, you know? And um, I mean, I, I guess that's going beyond industrial design, but it, it shows where you can apply the design process. Design thinking and the design process can be applied to any aspect of a business once it's used correctly and once you stay focused on the customer's needs. Design innovation, the design thinking, these ways of thinking, and these tools, it's been far more valuable nowadays with the amount of jobs they can apply to and how important they are. Job design thinking or the use of design thinking methods is really useful for companies provided they do it correctly. There is evidence that design thinking not only re relates to the design process, but that it can be applied to every aspect of a business and can be hugely beneficial for any company. Design thinking is all about focusing on the user at every stage of the development. We always empathize with our end users and that's important obviously because it gives you the validation of a hypothesis you might have had in your mind about what a customer needs, uh, what they desire, what's viable and what's feasible for you to actually un undertake. So having that better knowledge beginning a project or beginning a business is going to validate things for you and mitigate the amount of risk associated with failure further down the line. The um, key thing for a business is to identify a market need and the market need comes down to people and understanding what they want and what they need to make their life easier. And design um, really emphasizes a focus on the user, on the customer and understanding that need. When you get that right, then, you've a bit, then you have potential to start a business around that solution. There is a need to create awareness of the positive effects of adopting a design thinking mindset. Using design thinking methodologies is usually beneficial for every business and it is more important now than ever for companies to adopt these principles as focusing on user needs is the key to a successful business. So they say the next competitive advantage in business is user experience and user experience gets to the point of delighting your user, understanding deeply what your user needs, wants and how to provided to them in a pleasing way. That's what design is all about. Design, I think, designing experiences, as I said, and designing for business and innovation, I think that's where the biggest jobs in the world are gonna be in the next five to 10 years. Although it's evident that design thinking methodology is hugely important, there was also evidence that suggests that a lot of companies weren't adopting this mindset. It surprises me sometimes how, you know, people don't understand the creativity very surprising to see that other businesses don't take on that ability to kind of think through and rationalise you know, all, all aspects of what you do. After researching the core structure of the three different universities and institutes, that are mentioned in the literature review, it was evident that there were major differences in the modules being taught. NCAD focuses on equipping designers with more aesthetic skills. During the first year, they focus on design research and observation techniques, along with development of design skills, such as problem solving, conceptualization, prototyping, and digital presentation. Then moving into second year, students are taught human-centered design, 3D CAD, rapid prototyping, and further development of the fundamentals of design process. Um, but for me, uh, NCAD was a place where you really kind of focused on kind of uh, refining your ideas. Um, from a kind of a technical point of view, it was about more than the whole process of going from initial concept through to development. I suppose it would be the one failing when I did the course, I don't know if it has changed now, but that there wasn't really anything to do with even even understanding of like uh, patenting or design registrations and things like that, there was none of that um, taught, which I think is uh, would have been worthwhile. Um, in NCAD it was very unstructured, which is positive and negative. So research was when I say we were taught it, it was very unstructured and it was learned by doing rather than being taught formal techniques. 
So I think it definitely helped to have gotten a little bit more formal training um, and probably structured training if you like. There wasn't that much emphasis on business and obviously when you create a product you have to be very aware and understanding of the commercial realities. Um, now because I'd grown up under a family business I had already, because of dinner table talk, I, I had heard a lot of stuff but I, I think that that's, um, that was something that maybe was missing a little bit. I know from my point of view was that you kind of designed a product and you kind of did it in a bubble <coughs> where you just concentrate on the design, the manufacturing, kind of the form, the function. And it just stopped there. Yeah, it stopped and that was it. That was it. It was kind of like... You product know. design at DIT Bolton Street used a more technical approach to equipping the design students with skills. Um, in product design we would have learned a lot of technical skills, a lot of hard skills, um, being an engineering college a lot of it was geared towards the engineering side of product design and um, not as much on maybe the software skills, certainly not enough on the likes of sketching and the design thinking models. You know, I did six years of engineering in college and that was, you know, prototyping and modeling, but I never considered it design, I considered it engineering, whatever that was. Metalwork in first to third year and then engineering in fifth to sixth year. Um, we certainly weren't taught that much about the entire process using design thinking in college and it's probably only since doing the Masters in Maynooth that I've gotten a full handle on the full process and used it to its entirety. Product design, marketing and innovation at Maynooth University uses a more multidisciplinary approach. I mean we cover a very broad spectrum of subjects in the product design course, um, even by its name it stands out from other colleges because they include like learning innovation and learning about marketing. You're basically taught the whole product development process from start to finish and um, really kind of what the role of an entrepreneur is taking an idea from early conception all the way to creating value and profitability from it. There is a much wider selection of modules taught at Maynooth University that benefits the student more if they decide to pursue a career path of self-employment. Yeah, and I think Maynooth in particular, even ahead of some other uh, design uh, courses in, in Ireland, because uh, as I said, we have the whole uh, business element of, of the course uh, ingrained deeply in what we do to make sure that any product we design is marketable to an end user at the end of the day. So we're very lucky here as well in Minute to have the Department of Anthropology. There's not many other universities in Ireland that teach anthropology so we have that influence here in the college so we get a deeper understanding of techniques around empathy and interviewing end users and stuff like that that I feel like in other uh, courses might be lacking. A lot of the stuff I learned in DIT, as I said, were the hard skills and I feel going back to do this course in Minute is giving me the, the softer skills which are actually now becoming more and more important. Minute has taught me to prop, taught me to use proper ethnography skills um, and I think there's far more value in them now. It's becoming clear that there is a huge gap in the modules being taught in product design depending on which university or institute you attend. More than 99% of European businesses are small to medium enterprises. They provide two thirds of the private sector jobs and primarily responsible for economic growth in Europe. But yet, education is formed in a way to create employees and not employers. It's hard to be part of the rat race, you know what I mean? You yeah. have to work the nine to five, this is your job, you learn one thing, you go in, you get a job, you work until you're yeah. 65. And it was very, I found a very traditional route of where you develop your skills to become a designer and then you go and you work for someone else or you mm. become part of the agency or whatever yeah, it still true. was. But I think now there's more of a push of people launching their own products. Um, the content and course structure of product design courses are constantly changing. Not enough emphasis is made if the designer tries to follow a career path of self-employment or tries to bring a product to market. So we've made a number of changes to the course since its existence of about 10 years. We were picking standalone subjects that seemed really exciting and nice. So we had psychology subjects, we had more science and technology subjects, and then we, you know, we had a reasonable number of design subjects. We learned over the years that it was too fragmented and it was missing uh, strong core 
thing to, to, to help the students understand how all these subjects work together. So we paired back on some of the science subjects and some of the psychology subjects because the students just didn't know how they fit and we increased big projects so big kind of centerpiece projects that, that and to try and demonstrate to students more how these skills come in together so we suppose reduced in some ways the number of skills and focused on harmonizing those um, and making sense of those for the students there's still a gap in education when it comes to teaching students the fundamentals in business and entrepreneurial skills. Not only with design education, but the same can apply to all college courses. Um, I definitely think uh, uh, entrepreneurial skills should be taught to a wide range of courses. Um, in every field there is a you know, need for advancement. People are afraid of, of not knowing what to do, so they, they'll just hold on to the idea and they'll never go anywhere. Like, so. I heard a stat that one person in their lifetime will always have a one million euro idea but nobody acts on it, you know, so yeah. you just kind of, I think having that, having that, the, the platform in college that people get a bit, an insight to the steps that you take to learn how to become an entrepreneur or set up your own business, I think that is, that's the key, like, everybody has good ideas, it's just whether you can act on them or not. It's clear that people with a design background have some advantage when it comes to setting up their own business in relation to their skills. But most entrepreneurs and business owners haven't got a design background. As mentioned earlier, 99% of European businesses are SMEs. So it is a huge importance to instill entrepreneurial skills onto everyone in third level education. It may take a full college course to become a master of the business skills required to set up their own business. But it is important to teach the fundamentals of what's required so that if they decide to set up their own business, it's not completely new to them. Like I did business studies in, in secondary school um, uh, all the way through to leaving cert level and um, I think even just that alone gives you just an innate kind of a knowledge of how things work, you know, buying, selling, but as far as college was concerned, they didn't really cover any of that and I think it would have been beneficial. A, a grounding in, in sort of a commercial understanding of like, you know, how to draw you know, various documents and agreements and things like that and an understanding of protecting your designs with design registrations and patenting and the pros and cons of all of those, having a, a good understanding or you know, even a basic understanding of those things so that when you do start to research them for yourself that it's not completely new. Three of the six entrepreneurs that were interviewed stated that they didn't acquire the business skills through education but they did have one major advantage. They had a family member who was an entrepreneur. I grew up in a family business that my, my, both my parents ran a kitchen company. I think, it, I think I had an advantage growing up in a family business. I think it would have helped a lot, a lot more. I think a lot of my classmates had excellent ideas mm. and maybe didn't have the, the wherewithal or the, the sort of surrounding support to see it as an option to push them forward into entrepreneurship. I, I suppose I have to, uh, you know, give credit to my dad for that. My dad's always been very influential in what we do. Uh, we still work with him, you know. Um, he, he was the one who, he's always been quite entrepreneurial himself. Um, and he saw it and he thought, this, this, you know, there's definitely got to be a market for, for this. So he, he actually asked around and spoke to some people that he'd use sort of, um, on the periphery of the toy industry. I kind of taught myself when my dad kind of always he taught me as well, like, I looked up to him because he, he set up his own business from a young age and he, he kind of came from nothing and, and worked his way up, so I think that's where I learned. Rather than school, I, I, don't, think I, I don't think they, they teach any entrepreneurial or set up your own business in school, they should, but they don't really, I didn't learn any of it in school. So. Without this bed of knowledge that they gained from the family members, uh, creating their venture mightn't have been possible. People with marketable ideas or concept mightn't have someone close by to call on for advice. Throughout the findings and analysis, it was becoming increasingly clear that there were some gaps in the education system surrounding product design and entrepreneurship. It was evident that there wasn't enough emphasis on the key skills required to set up a business. Although Maynooth University did provide a sufficient amount of knowledge related to entrepreneurship, it was also evident that these skills were going unnoticed. Both NCAD and DIT were lacking a sufficient amount of modules based around entrepreneurship and the fundamentals of venture creation. It's clear how important design thinking methods are and it leads to the need for, for not only entrepreneurial skills and the fundamentals of venture creation, 
being taught in, in the universities, but also design thinking methods. Design thinking methods and entrepreneurial skills should be taught to every course in third level education. Because any person from any educational background can come up with a marketable idea that could lead to creating a new business. Because it's highly important for them to have some grounding of the steps required to set up their own business. I think in every, in every aspect of every different degree that you do in college, I think there should be a, a break-off section where you learn about, right, if you're going to go self-employed, you need to learn the basics of setting up your own business because people don't realise, they might not have it in their, in, their, in their main aim to, when they leave college, to set up their own company, but like, it's, a, it's a great thing to know. And you, like, If you do end up falling back and going off doing something different than you're setting up your own company, you're always going to have those skills and you're always going to use them. So, 100%, I think it should be something that should be taught in school before you get to college. Like, it should be compulsory, true skill, true secondary skill, and definitely in college. In product design and principles, so I suppose we call them design thinking often, um, should be taught wider than just product designers. And I think every discipline, both science, Based, so whether it's more engineering or, or just hard science kind of research and then the other side of kind of business they will benefit by that appreciation for the end user the person who's who you know you're you're creating a new technology for if the person creating it can understand can empathize with the people who are going to use it so I think I think it definitely merits being taught wider it's uh, it's very important for all, all courses or people in, in all different fields to to have a experience in, in entrepreneurship. Um, I think everyone should kind of look around and see what's what's wrong in the world or in a business or look around to see some sort of opportunity, whether it's a new technology or a new way to do things um, because I guess that's that's the creative culture that, that makes, uh, makes new things happen. I think that entrepreneurial skills should be taught in a, a more of a wider range of college courses than they are at the moment because I think they're skills for life and a, a lot of people uh, try and set up their own businesses as, at some point and they may take inspiration from their own subject. Very basic level, just the design thinking process should be taught or should be instilled on people in some way. Um, because if, if people knew that from an early age and applied it to everything they encounter, I think the world would be a lot better off, you know. Um, everything would be more considered, there'd be a lot less waste. If everyone thought like that, yeah. everything would just run smoothly. It's evident that they have a strong perception of these skills being taught to everyone. Most of the participants are entrepreneurs and have experienced firsthand the lack of knowledge being taught in third level education regarding entrepreneurship and new venture creation. The importance of instilling this knowledge and basic understanding of design thinking methods could have had a huge positive effect on both the individual and in society. You don't need to be a genius, it's very straightforward. It's, you know, it's a number of steps and if, if they could see and talk to other people who've done it, and realize actually it's it's a number of mundane steps and things go wrong and things go right it demystifies it and it takes it takes the kind of unachievable view of it down and i think that that's a big thing so because anyone can do it once. the role of a designer is constantly evolving and so must the educational system to meet the demand in society Designers have a number of, but not all the skills required to successfully establish a new business venture. Product designers share a lot of skills and traits with successful entrepreneurs, due to being trained in design thinking methods. Design thinking is usually important in the successful creation of a new business. The educational system needs to adapt in order to successfully create new entrepreneurs to meet the increasing demand in society. Implementing entrepreneurial skills and design thinking methods into all third level education could see a rise in the number of new businesses being created and in turn could see a rise in economic growth. To be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be incredibly selfish. Don't go into it thinking it's going to be easy because nothing's ever easy. You have to make 
a lot, lots of sacrifices, both on behalf of yourself and your family and friends. And it takes a certain degree of single-mindedness. You need to be really dedicated, um, you know, to what you're doing. Make sure you have a good understanding of who your user is and are you solving a real need. So that's definitely important. I also think, to a certain extent, you need to rely on the, I suppose, the goodwill of people. When we started, we started in the summer and we had the whole summer out we filming courses, we were building it, and then when we came to the winter, everybody stopped playing golf. We couldn't be out filming, so that was a bit of a struggle. We were trying to keep our heads afloat. The money stopped coming in for a few months, so it was kind of, it was a struggle. There were some days that you didn't see how we were going to get over the next hurdle, and it was tough. Some days you just feel like going and getting a 9 to 5 and just, just getting a, a weekly wage every week. But you have to just keep going, and I think if you, if you don't give up and you break through those barriers, that's what, that's what really makes you, and that's, what, that's how you get to the next stage and how you build a proper company. I think everybody, no matter how sleek you are, you're going to face you know, big doors that are shut in front of your face and you've you got to persist. From going from being a designer to running a business, you need to, have, um, you need to dig pretty deep and, and uh, you know, believe in, in what you're doing. So yeah, I, whenever I meet with entrepreneurs, I'm always trying to impart that kind of early stage soft skill stuff of, of interviewing. And, Data analysis and you know, hunting for insights and meaning because it'll it'll improve the product, but it also helps sell the product. If I was to give one piece of advice to an entrepreneur, and this is the most important thing, is find someone to do it with you. Doing it on your own is very very hard, and having someone who you can bounce ideas and concepts and someone who can you can discuss things with, who understands everything that you're discussing and the nuances of the complexity of, of your issues, something you can discuss the, these things with, is the most important thing to have.